You're listening to the Just Django podcast. My name is Matthew Frere. I'm the host of the show and creator of Just Django. In this first season, I'm having conversations with individual creators, founders, and entrepreneurs that are using Django to run profitable online businesses and side projects. This episode's guest is Herman Martinez. Herman is a software developer, indie hacker, and creator of Bear Blog, a website that lets you start blogging while keeping your pages tiny, fast, and optimized for search engines. Um, I'm curious about the on the game development side because one of my close friends is is getting into game development, and it seems tough in SA. Um, the industry doesn't seem as well. Okay, it's definitely not as big as the states, but I'm curious what's your perspective on on the game development industry in SA? So it really depends on uh, on what your focus is. is there, are, there are quite a few small development houses in uh, Cape Town and in Johannesburg that do um, contractual work for larger companies. So uh, an example is the, the company I was working for had a contract out with Disney to build their Magic Academy games. Um, and that was like, uh, some Frozen games, some Mickey Mouse games, uh, and we had very little original content coming out. Um, but then if you compare that to another game dev company that's in uh, Four Ways, Cal Four Ways, <laughs> uh, okay. who released uh, Boot Fighter, is yeah. Boot Fighter is for, you know, it's for a South African audience because it's sort of centered around uh, the, you know, Four Ways stereotype, uh, but, and you know that that made waves that was pretty good but i'd say that the the company that's really killing it in south africa is uh it's this little um game game dev house called free lives they created bro force um and they got a movie deal with the expendables producers to create a free game called the expender bros using the expendables characters which they released for free on steam and they made a decent chunk of change off of that, uh, and it also fed into Broforce becoming big. And they actually did super well. Um, they ended up, uh, it's currently not the case anymore, but they ended up like getting a mansion. And then like the developers would all live together in the mansion and make games um, and throw <laughs> sick parties. Uh, <laughs> but they have, they have since uh, sold the mansion, I believe. Um, and uh, are working on some interesting VR stuff. Uh, I'd say that game dev in South Africa is pretty much the same as it is anywhere else in the world in terms of audience, just because of the, you know, the platform. Um, but we don't have the big titles. You know, we don't have like EA or Riot or any of those here. So if you are looking to work at a big company, then yeah, you're going to have to move to, you know, to the United States or to, to London. Um, but if you're right. into making like indie titles, then, you know, do it. It's tough, but do it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, so do you think in the beginning, while you're on this kind of, I, I believe it's self-development journey. I mean, I don't, I don't think the resources are uh, as available as like typical web development, or maybe, I don't know, do you have an opinion on that, the actual learning process? <clears throat> Uh, so <laughs> I'd say that in some cases, game dev is, is simpler than web dev um, mm. because of the tooling that's available. So if you you know open up Unreal Engine or if you open up Unity, you can do a lot without really knowing how to program. Um, I mean, if you're trying to build a production game, it's going to be difficult. You know, there's a right. lot there's a lot of stuff that goes into building a game. Um, but I'd say that there's a lot of resources out there that'll hold your hand pretty pretty well uh there's been a rise in sort of low code or no code tools for game engines um uh, uh, unreal engine had the has the blueprint system for like visual coding uh i believe that unity has recently acquired a company that built a plugin for unity called bolt which was also a visual coding tool and it essentially like lets you set up state machines to control all your actors inside of the scene. Um, and I believe that Hearthstone was mostly coded using uh, the visual coding tool. Um, oh, okay. But, uh, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say that the, the most difficult thing with 
creating a game is finishing it. And I'd say it's the same when you're building a product for the web, right? Is it's you can spend the weekend and have you know a very minimum a minimal product, uh, but the long tail of development is really what gets you. It's the you know crossing right. the T's and dotting the I's and building an audience, which should be an entire <laughs> entire other thing. Um, yeah. So game dev, you know, making a game fairly straightforward. I mean, we have game jams, which are like hackathons where we spend 72 hours, you know, cracking away at a theme and you can make something in 72 hours that's playable and fun. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you can release it. <laughs> right. Well, my my experience with game development is very limited. I've played a little bit with 3JS and I, I really like that. Um, uh, hopefully... I'll ask you some more on that later, but I want to go back to more of the beginning. So you said you studied computer science at Tux. Uh, how do you think that that prepared you for becoming an actual developer? So my opinions have actually changed on this um, over the past year is I used to be quite skeptical of how university prepared me for uh, being a developer, based purely on the fact that the stuff that I was learning in university wasn't what I was using in industry, right? I was doing, you know, computer science, computer science, data structures, algorithms, um, memory management in C, C++, uh, and then ended up working at my first job uh, doing e-commerce development using Magento. And, you know, the first couple of months on that job is like I had to pretty much learn how to program again. Um, that being said, the reason why I've kind of changed my opinion is that uh, for, is for two reasons. The, the first one is that by learning all these lower computer science-y concepts is you've got a better understanding of what's going on under the, uh, under the hood. Uh, but the second one is a bit more, is a bit more nuanced. So I've been teaching uh, web dev and game dev over the past couple of years. I spent um, I spent uh, three months in Accra in Ghana at the beginning of last year mentoring at a tech school uh, and startup incubator and then lectured for a bit at Vega in Cape Town for both programming and game development. And what I came to realize is that these very, very basic, well, what we as experienced programmers think of as basic concepts are actually fairly complex. Um, three things specifically, that would be uh, the concept of assignment, you know, where you have like X is equal to one plus Y um, is w we're using assignment, not equality over there. And that is pretty tough for some people to wrap their heads around. The The second one is, is iteration, you know, going through a, uh, a list of things and then performing actions on those things. Um, and then the final one, when you're getting a bit more advanced is concurrency. Uh, and these are all like fairly complex concepts for a person to wrap their head around. And I realized that studying computer science gave me an intuitive grasp of that. Like I can, I can get into pretty much any programming language and sort of understand how it works, even if I'm not familiar with it, based on that. And I'd say that that is very different to how programming is being taught now, uh, or in a lot of cases now with like coding boot camps and stuff where they're like, you haven't coded at all in your life. Uh, we're gonna introduce you to React. And right. so you've got this like huge abstraction away from the basics. And and there's, there's an analogy I like to use over here, which is uh, how, Programming is like becoming a chef, right? We we have um, we have frameworks, uh, we have tools and processes, um, and then we've got like those underlying concepts. And so for a chef, the the underlying concepts are you know <clears throat> what flavor goes well with what other flavor. How do you prepare the individual ingredients? You know, do you when you're using onions, like you generally uh, fry them beforehand to get the sugars to come up? And it's all these all these little things that turn you into uh, a chef and you then can make your own recipes. But the, the the way that we're learning coding now is kind of like just opening up a recipe book 
and following the recipe is you're going to make a cake, right? But if you wanted to change the cake slightly is you're going to have a really tough time because you don't actually understand the fundamentals that went into the construction of this cake. And mm. I, I don't want to say that's lost. I, I firmly believe that if you go to a coding bootcamp and you do learn that and then you sort of skill downwards and you become a lot more familiar with the underlying concepts, fantastic. But I think that that's not the most effective way to learn. Um, it might be the quickest way for you to have an accreditation, which is very useful. Um, but I'd say that it's super important for people to like really nail these underlying uh, concepts before they start moving on to you know, the the recipes, the frameworks, the the complications right. that come with, you know, node package management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I'm a good example of what you're actually talking about because uh, I went straight into Python and then from there straight into Django. And I would say my Python knowledge was not strong enough going into Django, but you just somehow make it work. And then, like you said, you go backwards and then you start to understand the abstraction of all the classes and then you only start to understand how everything actually works internally. Mm. But you said you could basically jump into any programming language. I've only witnessed one person able to do that. And it's really impressive uh, when people say, yeah, maybe we'll just use C sharp or maybe we'll just use Java. And it's, I think for, for beginners or people who can't do that, it's kind of like, what do you mean? How can you just compare them like that? Don't you have to have, don't you have to have studied that particular one to understand? But like you're saying, you can kind of jump into any one of those languages. Uh, do you think that that's helped you in web development? Because those concepts, I think going from like C++, surely must be slightly different to when you're working on the web. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, the and, and that kind of goes into the, the higher level, lower level understanding is that on a, on a fundamental level, most most programming languages, not all, but most programming languages are pretty much the same, right? You, uh, they're just a series of logical steps, right? And if you're very familiar with how that works, you can pick up other languages with with ease. And obviously, there's a lot of nuance that comes with different uh, ways that things work. Is like if you um, are a game developer uh, example for me I, you know was doing game developments and then moved over to doing uh javascript for the web is there was a lot to learn there was a hell of a lot to learn but because i understood the fundamentals of programming of you know the assignment iteration concurrency is it certainly made it a lot easier i'd say another good analogy for that would be like an athlete, right, is that if you are a uh, Olympic gymnast, you're probably going to be really good at other sports, or at least you're going to be better at those sports than someone who is just starting that sport. Mm. Um, so there's definitely a lot of crossover. And while you might not be a brilliant basketball player, you've got that, you know, physical understanding of how your body works and interacts with the world that you can become a basketball player fairly fast or, you know, become right. adequate fairly fast. Right. Okay. It makes sense. So then going through computer science and then game development, how did you get started with Django? So I was, <clears throat> I was working uh, at, at Sea Monster doing game developments and I've always had like little side projects that I've, I've worked on at the time what I really wanted to do was build a ride-sharing application uh, or a ride-sharing website. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with Blah Blah Car in Europe. No. So it's kind of, it, when I say ride-sharing, it's for longer distances. So it's not, it's not Uber. It's more if I wanted to drive, sorry, if I wanted to get from, say, Paris to uh, Grenoble, I could go onto the website and say, hey, I'm trying to get from here to here, and I could search for other drivers who are going in that direction, and I could get a ride with them for you know so many uh, so many euros. Um, and it's it was super useful for me when I was uh, backpacking around Europe, and I saw that nothing like that was available in South Africa. So I started building out a uh, little proof of concept in my free time using Flask, 
uh, and I was, you know, completely unfamiliar with with uh, Python for the web. Um, so Flask was my introduction over there, and it started getting complicated because I kept on having to add more and more stuff. So I had to add my own ORM. I had to, you know, add my own libraries for authentication. And at the time, a, a good friend of mine was uh, working at an agency that used Django for all of their projects. And he's like, hey, man, you should just use Django. It does all of that stuff. It's got an ORM built in there. It does authentication for you. Uh, you're making a lot more work for yourself. So I took a look at Django and I um, decided to give it a spin. And I actually managed to, to rebuild what I had built already, which took me about two weeks in you know three or four days. And I'm like, wow, this is mm. this is really good rapid development. And the way that Django is structured, also, uh, it's very um, very opinionated. Right? Is right. like you have to do it in the in the Django way. Uh, and I kind of like that. I like I like a programming language a programming language or a framework that tells me where things go because otherwise I have to create my own semantics for it. Um, That's interesting because <laughs> I, I was I was going to ask that. I find that normally the more experienced programmers are the ones who'd be more fussy about the opinionated frameworks and would be completely anti using the framework. I'd say that I fall into a category of of programmers who who just wants I, I who just wants to get things done. I mean, one of the reasons why okay. I use uh, why I use Django right now as opposed to some of the newfangled you know Express JS Node uh, what you call it is. It's battle tested. Uh, it's quite opinionated, and I know how to use it very well. And I think that that overall, there's a bit too much of like shiny object syndrome amongst developers, mm. right. where they'll go off and they'll start using a new a new uh, framework. But there are so many unknown unknowns in that framework that they spend most of their time, you know, trying to figure out issues that don't have solutions yet. And Django has been around for long enough that there are solutions to most of the issues. And so, so those are all like known issues and here's how you fix them. And there are much fewer cases where you run into something where someone's like, oh, yeah, there isn't actually a solution to this. Perhaps, you know, in the next release of Django, they'll, they'll fix that up. Um, right. So, I, yeah, I, I'd say that I, I have a very practical way of approaching programming in that I want to get something out of it with the least amount of futzing. I don't want to spend right. too much time trying to trying to configure everything right. Uh, I think a great example of of that is that I use Heroku because Heroku just like does a whole bunch of stuff, you know, under the surface that lets me just push to my Git repository and it has it live for me, and I don't have to you know do all kinds of orchestration. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a the same sort of pragmatic approach that Corey was talking about, mm -hmm. which is learn only what you need to learn, do only what you need to do. Uh, but it's it's fascinating hearing that from. I don't want to say experience isn't the right word, but it's like developers who come from the the much lower level programming languages. I find that they, it's very funny listening to them. They're always so opinionated on never using frameworks, but that I I like that approach. It's it seems like a much more effective approach, especially when you're building your own project. Yeah, I, I'd say that there is like there, there's obviously something to be said about building out all your own stuff, but I mean you're going to spend more time on it, right? Is mm. uh, let's take something that everyone you know hates doing is authentication authentication is messy is you need to um you know make sure that there's a way for people to get their lost passwords and the uh, and that uh, there's you know you're handling your csrf tokens correctly and all of that and like sure you could probably build out a better sign up flow than django and all auth provides if you did it yourself you could create you know magic links or something but you're going to spend days or weeks doing that whereas i really right. just want to get from A to B in yeah. an, an efficient way, and hell, if you know if one of your projects takes off, and you can hire a whole bunch of engineers to sit around and you know make your sign up flow immaculate, then great. But right now, it's about doing what needs to be done. Yeah, 
So, so the project that I uh, found you through was Bear Blog, and it's a Django project. So, could you talk about how you came up with the idea for Bear Blog? Sure. So, I I'm sure you've seen the a trend going around where everyone, and this actually ties into what we were just talking about. It's like I'm I am sick of I'm sick of of JavaScript, man. Is <laughs> It's like permuted every aspect of my life and I just can't get away from it. <laughs> um, but if you if you follow a bunch of threads on Hacker News, you'll see that a whole bunch of other people are also at that point where, where we're talking about how like we've overcomplicated the web. Uh, it's, you know, I was working at a, at a startup uh, which does boat rentals, the Airbnb model of boat, boat rentals. And we had, um, you know, a RESTful API at the back end, and then we had a React front end. And we cracked along really, really well. But the amount of time that it would take to ship new features was really high because we would have to, you know, get our new API calls or a new API endpoints set up. And then we would have to mess around with, with React, which especially at the time was you know, just coming into the market and it had problems and workarounds and hooks weren't invented yet. So we would spend a lot of time doing fairly simple things. Um, and when I set up a previous project of mine, uh, some words for me, which is a email journaling application where it's also running Django, uh, where every day, you know, it sends you an email saying, hey, it's time to, to write a new journal. And you just reply to that email and uh, it logs it in your it logs it as your journal entry. Um, I managed to set up the prototype for that in, you know, a couple of days and then refined it over, I'd say about a month and a half. And at the same time I was working in React and to, to release features that were minuscule compared to what I had done would take, you know, weeks, months. And with Bear, it was, uh, well, what actually happened is I had a I had a Jekyll site that was my personal blog, um, and my my company just sketched me uh, was cracking along fairly well, and I was wondering, you know, what what should I do with my time? Um, maybe I should start writing again because I actually do enjoy do enjoy writing, um, and so I decided to start writing a couple more blog posts and potentially work my way up to writing longer form content. Um, at some point, I do want to write a book. But the first step that I took was to go and restyle my blog. <laughs> and so I'm there, like, making it look nice. And then I'm like, ah, oh, but it's so much. And I was I was still kind of, like, over, uh, you know, extra styles and JavaScripts doing everything. So I just, like, started removing all of that. And, I, and it ended up just being, like, a plain HTML page. I'm like, okay, that's actually, that's great. <laughs> And at the, I, I was uh, reading a talk by, I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Majek, uh, hold on. It's, it's a talk by Idle Words, uh, uh, ah, here we go. Um, oh, I'm definitely going ma, ma, <laughs> to, Masiej Keglowski. And he gives a talk about the website obesity crisis, which is, you know, how all websites are just like bloated and full of trackers and full of bugs and uh, are hard to maintain. And it really resonated with me. Uh, and so I had this HTML page that was my blog. And I thought, actually, you know what? Other people would like to do this. Like other people would like to have access to something like this. So it took me three days to, to set up a, a blog with Django that was, you know, super, super minimal, super easy to use. Uh, and I posted about it on, on Hacker News. And over an 18 hour, hour period, I had, you know, over a thousand blog, blogs created on the platform. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it stuck on the homepage of Hacker News for a full 24 hours. Um, and uh, it had about 58,000 hits during that time. She was... Now, what was uh, one thing that I hadn't prepared for is uh, I hadn't set up my own certificate. I was using uh, Cloudflare CDN, 
and I was <clears throat> calling the API to add C names for all the uh, all the subdomains. So right. if you were to start one, it would be Matt's blog, Matt's blog dot bear blog or Matt's dot bear blog dot dev. It would then go and add Matt as a subdomain um, via sure. the Cloudflare API. Uh, but Cloudflare, at least the plan that I was on, only allows a thousand records. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I w- I did not expect so much uh, so many people to sign up, and yeah. uh, I <laughs> went and I accidentally deleted a. Uh, a record and had to manually update like 150 records by hand um and then ended up setting up a let's encrypt license uh, sorry a let's encrypt certificate to, to handle it so it it all works now but it was a bit of a bit of a silly in hindsight and i was right. very stressed at the time <laughs> i don't think anyone would have seen that coming though i mean that that's an ex- extremely large number of people to flood the system yeah one one thing that I uh, and I've become like a bit of an advocate for for Cloudflare now is like Cloudflare handled that traffic like a like a beast and they handled it for mm. free. Um, you know, it just everything was hitting the CDN, and uh, I was running on you know a little seven dollar per month Heroku Dino, right. and yeah. you know chugged along perfectly fine. Um, but then a couple uh, so three months later. I decided to to write about it, and uh, I wrote a thing like, "Hey, you know, I'm running two thousand blogs on a seven dollar per month uh, Heroku Dino," and I posted that, and it got to the front page of Hacker News again. <laughs> um, but then things went terribly. Right? Is so because I was using a Let's Encrypt certificate, and I wasn't routing all the blogs through Cloudflare, because in order to, to get it rooted through Cloudflare, you actually have to get a wildcard a wild uh, certificate, and it, it just went and it tore my little server to pieces. And so <laughs> on the Hacker News thread, it was just people like, well, this is ironic. And I'm just there <sighs> like leopard eating my face. Jeez. <laughs> oh, <my God>. oh, <laughs> Okay, well, you clearly have a some sort of gift of getting to the top of Hacker News, so I'll I'll be in touch. Um, <laughs> I want to ask, why did you make the project open source? Uh, well, I I really like open source projects. Um, I, I I've been following Plausible. I'm not too sure if you know Plausible, mm-hmm. the yeah, analysis. Um, I've been following yeah. their journey, and I've actually been using I've, I've subscribed to Plausible for just Sketch Me because I've de Googled all of my all of my projects. Yeah. Um, I do not like what Google is doing. And so uh, Plausible is running on just Sketch Me, and their pricing is reasonable, but it also makes you appreciate how much your data is actually worth, right? Is that the you know $12 per month that you're paying to, paying to Plausible, is that's the amount of value that Google theoretically is getting from your data. Right. Um, but they've, they've open sourced their, their software over there. And you can theoretically go and spin up your own plausible, um, your own plausible account, yep. sorry, your own plausible instance. Um, and I like that concept, but also I just wanted to create something to that other people could use as a sort of starter project. So if you go into GitHub right now and you try and find like a blog starter, it's going to be pretty tough. I, I know because I went and I checked. <laughs> uh, Sure, there's there's like little projects here and there that someone's like, I made a blog in Django or I made a blog in Express.js, but they all have issues. And I know that Bear is is and will continue to be a very minimalist system. Um, and by making it open source, other people can use it as a base for their for their blogs or their blogging platforms that they plan to set up. Um, it also uh, sort of stimulates what's the word I'm looking for? It stimulates like people wanting to contribute. There's this hmm. one, I think he's Dutch developer got in touch with me, uh, Jan Rash, and he went and he created a bear Hugo theme. So <laughs> it's it's just a Hugo theme that is bear blog. And I've linked to it for people who want to self-host, you know, just an individual blog they can, uh, but using bear's aesthetic. Um, and I, I really like that. I like, I want to contribute to the open source community. And then mm. at the same time, you know, I do want to 
I do want to also make it financially viable. So the way uh, I can talk about Bear in relation to what happened with Just Sketch Me. So the journey that Just Sketch Me took was that I released it as a free product, or Simon and I released it as a free product, and uh, we just kind of like let it run. We popped in some some uh, like a buy me a coffee button, and the buy me a coffee button. An unfortunate fact of the internet is no one really wants to pay for free stuff. So mm. the buy me a coffee button was more of like a litmus test. It's to check whether people appreciate the product. We're not going to make a reasonable amount of money off of that. But if someone is happy enough with a product that they will go ahead and send you, you know, $5 to say thank you for it, it means that you've done something well. And we were receiving, uh, you know, after, you know, a couple of months of it being up, we were receiving about one or two cups of coffee a day. And wow. that was, that was like a good sign. We're like, okay, people really appreciate this. So then we built out an extra set of features uh, and we made them paid features. And then all the people who had contributed coffee to us beforehand, we like slipped them a free license key just as a little thank you for, you know, being early supporters. And that was a good way to validate uh, that idea. And also just like a nice, a nice positive uh, way to grow. It's like, instead of immediately going out and building out a, you know, payment gateway and uh, a sign up flows, we just wanted to test, see, you know, are, are mm. people happy with this? So with Bear, what I've done is I, I have been chatting to people uh, who are using the platform and they're super happy with it. And then, you know, there's also obviously the people who are like, hey, can we add Google Analytics? And I'm like, that's actually against <laughs> what <laughs> this is. Um, but there are obviously a lot of feature requests. So what I've done is I've created a little, uh, a little suite of features that are reasonable and have been requested a few times, and I've started building them out. Um, the one that I've just completed is uh, an analytics system that um, is privacy respecting, right? So this is actually, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this. What happens is you go to a, to a post and when you hover over the post, it uh, uses a tiny little bit of CSS to call a background image. And then that background image is actually the analytics endpoint. It's to, you know, get around, oh, wow. uh, get around, you know, bots and uh, headless headless chrome instances from being triggered yeah. as because generally what you would do with analytics is you would you would try and suss out whether it is a person or a bot using javascript but and this over here just uses the hover the hover feature in uh, css to check that that's so interesting and then it calls the analytics endpoint and uh, you get a, a hit which takes the ip address of um of that hit and it hashes it so it's anonymous um, and it uh, stores it, and you've got analytics. Uh, and that analytics system, I uh, popped it up there. It's still very much in beta, but I added a little thing like, "Hey, uh, you know, here's a buy me a coffee link. Send me an email um, if you want to gain some access over there." And I've had a few people buy me a coffee over the past two weeks. And again, that's like a positive. It's a positive sign. Yeah, yeah. So theoretically, in the next couple of you know, over the next couple of weeks or months, is I could build out um, a couple more of the features that are reasonable and have been requested a few times, and then have a little like premium suite that I then you know make accessible for five dollars a month or uh, twenty five dollars per year or something. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm I'm looking at Paddle right now, which allows for currency matrices that allows you to localize the amount of money that people will pay oh, which is that's super super useful yeah yeah that is definitely useful i've yeah. been looking for something like that yeah because current and this is a problem that i'm having with just sketch me as well is that the price is optimized for people in you know the united states and europe right um, but if yeah. you're in south africa nine dollars a month is 100 you know 160 rand that's a lot right. yeah. for people in brazil yeah, russia you know, we regularly get people, I, I, I set up a thing that says, if you can't afford this, get in touch with me. And 
you know, a couple times a, a week or even, you know, a couple times a day, depending on the traffic, someone will get in touch and be like, hey, listen, this is a, this is a bit pricey for, for me. Can you help me out? Or if you've mm. been disaffected by COVID, I'll probably just give you a free license key. Um, but I think that paddle is going to be the solution to my problems. And uh, I'm just waiting to, to hear back from them because it's one of those things where you, uh, you request an invite. And uh, so if anyone from Paddle is listening to this, hit your boy up. <laughs> <laughs> but this is super interesting. The business model is like put something out for free. And I really like how you worded it, that it's a litmus test. I feel like it's risky um, because you could argue that when something has a price, it, it kind of shows that it has more value than if it's for free. Uh, but the fact that people are sending you or that you're getting that many coffees, I agree with you that that shows that there's definitely appreciation. So it's a very interesting business model. I'd say that it's it also depends on the it depends on the industry, right? Is that right. Um, if I was creating like a CRM tool or or if I was doing something B2B, this would not be feasible because, yeah. um, you know, businesses want to interact with businesses who you know are reputable and everything and while i try my best to be reputable um i may you know go and spend two weeks up in the mountains and not respond to any of my emails mm. um i mean i do try to you know be diligent about it and i uh have put a lot of automations in place to make sure that people don't necessarily need to get in contact with me um but i also you know, I don't want to have to be at my computer all the time. So I'm, there's definitely <laughs> when, when people get into the whole like B2C or B2B argument is sure. You can make a lot more money, uh, at least as a smaller company selling B2B, but I'd say B2C can be a lot better for like lifestyle. Although that's just my very, very uh personal experience <laughs> I, I kind of agree with that i have the same experience yeah i i can i can let like and also if you take a look at the tools that i'm that i've released is they're not necessities for someone if my servers go mm. down like i'll have a couple of people who are pretty bummed and some people will leave the service um but no one's relying on it whereas if i am running a crm tool and it goes down like that's actual you know cash money that businesses are going to be losing out on there's going to be right. some some really angry people and right. i actually the reason that i do this is a is I, I want to make cool shit um and b i want it to feed into the way that i want to live my life as opposed to detract from it and so i tend to take on projects that i can see myself wanting to run in perpetuity. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, Bayblog is, is really interesting. Um, you talked about the the way that it uses the Cloudflare API and creates the CNAME, which makes a lot of sense. I, in my experience, people ask for tutorials a lot on multi-tenant sort of architectures. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, th I think it's safe to say Bearblog is a follows a multi-tenant architecture. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's pretty cool. It, I would say Bearblog is the poster child of Django. Why Django is awesome for bootstrapping ideas, because, like you said, you made it so quickly, and that's the whole point or selling point of Django is rapid development, and you got it up and running. I mean, with with really little a little amount of code. Um, yeah. Like there isn't even something like cookie cutter that you used. You just went, it looks like you just went Django start project and boom, there you go. Deploy that. Thanks. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, if you take, and as you, it's open source, so anyone can take a look at the, at the code base. It is very basic. Uh, I didn't try and do anything fancy with middleware. Everything is straightforward. And what's also nice about that is it means that other people can, easily work on it which is uh which is a pretty rare thing in software where every yeah. system is super unique and uh each developer has a lot of like domain knowledge specifically for that system with bear if you're familiar with with django you can go and take a glance through the code and pretty much figure where everything is figure out where yeah. everything is and you know get cracking with it um i 
uh, as far as the rapid rapid application development goes, is yeah, if you're if you're trying to make a little project and test the water over there, is you really don't want to spend months on it. Is you want to spend you know preferably a couple of weeks, um, but within within reason. Uh, there's actually something that I read a few years ago by Jason Cohen. He's the guy who currently runs WordPress Engine. Um, he sold uh, Smart Bear, and he talks about how you should have an SLC or a slick instead of an MVP. Um, and the SLC stands for simple, lovable, and complete. And that really, really resonated with me is that when most people set out to build their MVP is they build it with the value proposition that more will be added in the future. And I think that that is, sure, it's an MVP, but it's not a very good litmus test because, or it's not, and it's not a good product because you're saying this is going to be good as opposed to this is currently good. And with uh, with both just SketchMe and with BearBlog is the first iteration of the application was simple, you know, super super simple. It had you know basic features. It was lovable. Um, I like to think that both BearBlog and just SketchMe are very very lovable. I, I certainly love them, um, but they're also complete. Is if I stopped developing both BearBlog and just SketchMe. Um, just sketch me is a bit more mature right now, but had I stopped developing it back a year ago is it would still technically be complete. And that I think is a much better uh, way to look at whether uh, or how you should launch your small projects is if your project needs more than what it currently has in order for it to be complete, then it's probably not a very good product or it's, it's, it's the entire idea of, um, Designed by subtraction. There's, it's actually a, uh, there's a video game company. I'm sure you've heard of Shadow of the Colossus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the company that designed Shadow of the Colossus uh, is Eco, and they actually released a game with the same name, Eco. And in that game, what they did is they, they, they actually coined the term "designed by subtraction," where uh, the game is about you. It's you know got a bit of a. Uh, uh, you know, male savior trope, but it's you going and saving this girl. And there's all these demons that come and try and, you know, drag her down to the underworld. Um, and in the game, you've got a stick and you hit the demons. And then if you hit them enough, they go away. Now, the game started out as pretty much every other game of that genre does, where it's got, you've got your health bar and you can upgrade your weapons and you can, you know, get boosts and if you die you know whatever happens but then they all sat down and they said okay let's remove everything that doesn't influence the or doesn't um display the core mechanic and so the core mechanic of that game was it's a it's a story of the of companionship between this guy and this girl and it's a it's a fetch quest right and so they realized that actually they didn't need to have weapons they didn't add to the story in any way it was just a thing that people assumed you needed for a kind of game like this so instead they just gave him a stick and you can't upgrade your stick right your stick is just to to beat beat the little demons back to the underworld and then they're like but wait a minute we've we have a health bar for the character and like that was a big thing for them is like wow, we actually don't need a health bar. The health bar, mm. we've just put it in there because other games all have a health bar. And so the lose state of the game isn't that you run out of health. The lose state, the, the lose state is that um, the, the girl gets dragged away. Uh, so they, they kept on removing all of these features to accentuate the main point of the story of the, of the game. And they ended up crafting a, a brilliant game. Um, and they took that learning and they created Shadow of the Colossus as well, which ended up being, you know, one of the arguably best games to come out in the past 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so when building these SLCs, it's it's really good to sit down and say, like, is this feature that I am going to build out, is it just feature stuffing or does it really accentuate the product? So with Just Sketch Me, the initial build was just a single model 
that you could switch out, right? You had male and you had female and you could pose it. And what that did is it replaced the wooden mannequins that artists have, right? And that's what we wanted to do. It was lovely to use and um, it was complete. And uh, if we did nothing more with it, people would still use it because it is superior to the current way that they're doing it. And it's easy to use and it's free. And then we started, once we had validated that, we started building on it and we started making it so you could add multiple characters to scene and so that you could add like props and you could save your work in the cloud. And Bear is, is a similar example. Is like Bear was, and the name for, for Bear actually comes from, I wanted to call it Bear Blogging, B-A-R-E, because it's, you know, just bare bones. Right. Um, but I realized that that would be a bit like a, 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 nude, a nude website. You know, bear blog. Um, so, so I decided to go with bear instead. And it is exactly that. It's just basic, basic blogging. It is simple, it's lovable and complete. And now that people are like that litmus test has been, has come back red is I'm happy to, you know, add a bit of things to it that still emphasize the, the, the core, you know, privacy, simplicity um, aspects mm. of it while adding a bit of extra function. Now that's super interesting. I like the that sort of mindset of building instead of a an MVC or MVP. I like that. Uh, I think I'm going to use that approach. Earlier today I was actually I was reading a, a newsletter which landed up relating to to Beb quite significantly. It was very interesting. They were talking about the concept of powered by marketing and that actually a lot of indie hackers had been had been using it without really being aware of it. I'll leave the link in the in the show notes. Um, and Bearblog has that same sort of uh, powered by marketing. Right at the bottom in the footer, there's made with Bear. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, how has that helped with the marketing? I know you said that you got a, a really huge burst of users from, from the Hacker News uh, posts, but have you found that that actually helps a lot? Because I'm sure you're getting thousands of page views uh, from all the combined blogs. Yeah. So I, as I, as I mentioned just now, <clears throat> I had a, uh, I created a, another project, some words for me, which, uh, did not have anything that would allow it to market itself. And that's kind of by design because journaling is a very private, um, it's a very private practice. Uh, but because of that is I had a very hard time getting customers for it or had a very hard time finding users because if I wasn't telling people about the product, whether through, you know, just talking to people or, um, marketing efforts is there was no way for it to grow. And when I went into my next project is I really wanted it to be something that has, I don't want to say virality, but the ability to spread both into the system. And Bear has that, is that when you write a blog post, you really want people to read your blog. So you take that post and you share it with all your friends and you post it on, uh, I don't know, what are the cool kids using nowadays? TikTok. You post it on your TikTok. (laughs) Um, And then people read your post and at the bottom it says you know made with bear and you're like oh that's that's pretty neat and also it 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 attracts more of the kinds of people who would be into that sort of thing is like if i if i were the kind of person who saw bear and said like hey that's that's neat the kinds of stuff that i would write about would probably be in line with the ethos of bear you know privacy simplicity um and so it's actually a very good way to uh, reinforce that loop of having you know new people come in and and take a look at it. Um, let me I can actually share with you my uh, stats if you would like. Let me just open this up. Okay, so bear, uh, so the the only inf- the only stats that I have are are unique visitors, but measured by my CDN um, because I don't have any like. Analytics-y analytics running on Bear itself. Uh, so that would be, let's say, the past 30 days. Yeah, the past 30 days, we've got about 130,000 
um, wow. 130,000 uh, visitors, which is uh, wow. quite quite nice. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. And uh, there there are two very distinct spikes though. One um, one which was a Reddit post that I posted, and then the other one which was the Hacker News thing that uh, was mm. terribly ironic. <laughs> Oh, that's super interesting. Uh, to end off, I just wanted to ask a little bit about just sketch me. You did uh, an interview on indie hackers, so there's already quite a lot over there that people can go and find out. Um, but kind of more on the technical side. So I saw one of the technologies was uh, 3JS that you were using, and I'm curious uh, about the learning curve of 3JS, about your opinion on browser games or using 3JS for browser games, do you think, first, do you think that the learning curve for 3JS is, I'd say, if you're coming from already being familiar with, with JavaScript, um, would be easier than going into web de into game development with, say, Unity, Unreal en Engine for that, for another example, do you think it would be easier? Uh, and two, do you see the browser as or browser games getting more popular into the future? Or do you think with something like the PS5 being released now that we're going to see shifts away from browsers? I, those are some very good questions. Uh, so uh, <laughs> let, let me start with the, with the first one. Is, um, so I was, in a, I was in a very unique place. I had worked as a video game developer uh, inside of Unity, uh, messed around a bit in the Unreal Engine. Um, and at the and then my next job was working as a React developer, uh, so I became very familiar with the JavaScript ecosystem. So, 3JS for me wasn't too much of a learning curve, but it certainly does no handholding. So when you're using Unity, there's a lot of handholding. You've got a visual environment. You can you know drag and drop things into the scene. You can click on game objects and assign um, functionality or things to them. Whereas with 3JS, I know that there is an editor, but uh, I'm, I, it's not great. Uh, so everything was just done in you know pure uh, pure JavaScript, and it is complicated um, navigating a 3D space when you don't have those tools. But it is entirely doable, and some people have created some pretty impressive things in 3JS. I'd say that if you are looking to get into game development, don't start with 3JS. Uh, it would be better to start with something like Unity to get a better understanding of how, first of all, objects interact inside of a 3D space, uh, learning about vectors, um, learning about animations, and um, uh, and essentially how the game loop works, which is just a loop that runs uh, consistently all the time. If uh, your second question about building stuff uh, for the web well, uh, if we're going to be using our browser for that sort of thing, is I'm I'm a bit hesitant to say yes. I don't actually think so. I think that uh, we are still going to see stuff being built in game engine, well, in in sort of like your Unities and your Unreal engines and your game makers, and then potentially exported for the web. But things still do run better as standalone apps, uh, and your web browser also has the also has the pitfall that it, that it runs on a single thread. Uh, I could be incorrect, but I, I believe it does, which means that it doesn't have as much processing power. And even something like Just Sketch Me, which is not particularly graphically intensive, uh, can sometimes get a bit slow if you've got like five models in the scene. Um, Interesting. So I'd say it, it'll be it'll be a bit of a while before we can you know properly recreationally game in our browser as a norm. Um, but you know the groundwork is there, and yeah. it, compared to uh, when I started building Just Sketch Me uh, for the web in, in 3JS, like 3JS was was a bit newer, and it had more problems. And now it's become a bit more of a mature technology, and you can do a lot more on it. So I'd say if you're just starting out, don't jump right into 3JS and just get familiar with uh, with how game engines work. And if you really want to use your JavaScript, your JavaScript skills, I'm sure you can find a game engine that that is in JavaScript. <laughs> Have you played with React 3 Fiber at all? I haven't. I haven't. Is that a React game engine? 
Well, I think it's, uh, I could be wrong. It's kind of like a wrapper around um, 3JS to work with it inside of React. And it's gaining quite a lot of steam from what I can, can tell. I actually have a half built migration of moving just sketch me over to react sitting on my computer right now it's not using react 3 fiber but it's using something you know wrapper-esque and right. uh it got to a point where i was like componentizing all of my uh all of my sort of like scene subjects and then having to like pass information around using uh using props and uh redux and it was just giving me a headache and i'm like no 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 i'm actually i'm actually pretty happy with the with the setup i have now <laughs> Oh, Maybe awesome. if I built it from the ground up uh, that way, then it might have made more sense. But yeah. migrating it over was was a bit of a headache for me. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, where's where's the best place for people to get in touch with you? So I'm currently not on social media, um, but if you go to my blog, ramen.bearblog.dev, there's my email address over there. Feel free to to shoot me an email if you have some questions or uh, if you want to check out Just Sketch Me, it's at justsketch.me. And uh, yeah, that's my stuff. Awesome.